Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us here today for Trial Hub DX Virtual Edition. We are so excited to have all of you here with us as we go through our first of four Ask the Experts sessions. Uh, now we are going to hear from our product experts and evangelists today, so let's make sure we take a brief moment to remember our forward-looking statement. Please make any and all purchasing decisions based on currently available products and services and not any forward-looking statements that any of my panelists or myself may make today. Thank you. Now, uh, my name is Heather Dykstra. I'm the Developer Program Manager here at Salesforce, and I'm really excited to be able to welcome all of my panelists. But before I do that, I bet you're all wondering how you can actually ask us your questions. Well, you can do that by going to the chat and putting your questions in there. My moderators are already excited and putting those questions uh, in for all of us to see so that we can make sure we get those prioritized and asked for all of you. Now, let's go to my panelists because that's what we're all waiting for. So let's have them introduce themselves with their name, what they do here at Salesforce, and their favorite product that Salesforce has released since they joined the company. Let's start with Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Hill, product manager on Lightning Team, and I focus my time on UI frameworks. So LWC, Aura, Visual Force. This is where I spend all my time. Um, and my favorite feature that's been released since I joined Salesforce actually was by Claire today. She talked about the code builder, and this is by far the most exciting thing I have seen in my two plus years here at Salesforce. <laughs> I feel like that's a great transition to Claire. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm Claire Bianchi. I'm a director of product management here. I work on developer tooling. I'm actually the product manager for the web tools team that owns Code Builder, as well as the CLI teams. And so I own Salesforce CLI, Heroku CLI, and Oakcliff. Um, and my favorite uh, product that's actually been launched is org dependent packages, uh, which I know doesn't sound super exciting, but I think it's super exciting for a lot of our customers who have giant orgs and they really want to dig into packaging. And so I think org dependent packages are probably the most exciting things that have happened in the two years I've been here. Sweet. Now, Andy, I know you have something fun that you're really excited about. Why don't you share next? I do indeed. So Andy Fawcett, I'm product manager and uh, my awesome uh, PM team are responsible for features like Apex, Salesforce Functions, and, and Heroku Compute. So super pleased to be here and seeing everybody's questions. And I guess when I reflect on uh, what makes Salesforce so powerful on the platform, it's how it makes all the skills so inclusive of people building. So when I think about external services, they are an awesome way to bridge the gap between code and low code and our tools. So empowering our admins to use the code that our developers have created directly in tools like Flow. So I really love external services because of that capability. I love that we're talking about so many different features. All right, Alba, let's go with you next. Hi, my name is Alba Rivas. I am a developer evangelist. And my team tries to help you developers uh, adopting our tools. Uh, one of my favorite features, as I have been recently working on a project to help my uh, move customers from Visual Force to LWC, is Lightning Message Service. Because with Lightning Message Service, you can communicate Visual Force pages with Lightning Web Components, with Aura Components, and all very simply, seamlessly. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and I think uh, you just released a sample gallery application on that as well. So people should definitely go check that out after TDX today. And Michael, let's wrap up with you. You're you're a final panelist, but certainly not least. Thanks, Heather. Uh, my name is Michael Fritz. I'm a product manager in Salesforce Platform working on Andy's team. Um, probably my favorite feature is uh, Salesforce Functions, which we're uh, um, talking more about at TDX. Um, I worked on Heroku for a long time, and uh, Functions is a great example of us combining combining uh, technologies from Heroku and really building it into the to the Salesforce platform in a both for that manner. Awesome. So we are getting quite a few questions, and the most common one right now that I'm seeing in chat is about Code Builder. And Claire, everyone wants to know when is it available? When can we start using it? Awesome. So for those of you who missed the keynote, uh, Code Builder is our new web-based 
editor, um, which we're really, really excited by. It's built on top of Microsoft's Visual Studio Code Spaces, so you get, actually have a virtual machine in the background. Um, and it comes with all of the Salesforce goodness and tooling that we've already built, already pre-baked. Uh, we are launching Pilot literally today, um, which is awesome. Very, very excited. It's been two years in the making. Um, and so the pilot goes live today. It's going to be a small closed pilot. Um, please contact your AE and get nominated uh, for that if you'd like to try it out. Um, but we're really looking to go much bigger at Dreamforce, um, barring you know, forward-looking statement and all of that. Our plan is to go beta Dreamforce and hopefully make it available to anyone and everyone. Awesome. That is great news for everyone. Um, now, the next question I'm seeing is, uh, a little bit more on on some of those demos that we saw during the keynote. We also saw some stuff on Query Builder. Uh, is that something we can get our hands on today, or is that locked in with Code Builder? So that isn't locked in with Code Builder. That will be available once it's done and ready, which it isn't right now. Um, we've got sort of a prototype working that you all saw. Um, notice maybe that the results looked a little bit funky. We're still working on it, um, but the team is actively uh, working on it now. And we're hoping to launch that as a Visual Studio Code extension probably sometime by the end of this summer. Um, and then that will come with Code Builder out of the box um, when that beta starts up. So know that anything and everything that we are building from from now on will be available in Code Builder as well as Visual Studio Code Desktop for developer tools. Um, so we're really excited to be able to bring things that are a little bit more focused on somebody who wants to use a UI-based builder um, and make that actually available um, on the desktop VS Code extensions. Awesome. And we have one more question, uh, and it might be you or Andy that gives an answer here. But are there plans to remove the developer console? And how does the developer console impact the roadmap for Code Builder? Great. Uh, the developer console actively impacts the roadmap for Code Builder. And um, the reason for that is we want to give you one place to go. And if you want to be in the web, we would love that place to be Code Builder. If you want to be on desktop, we want that place to be Visual Studio Code and our extensions. And uh, the reason that Dev Console impacts our roadmap is that you won't be able to do that if we don't have all of the same features that Dev Console has also available to you in Code Builder as well as in our extensions. And so Dev Console is not going away today. It's probably not going away for a while if it goes away. And so I'm not willing to say that it's going away right now. But what I can say is hopefully in the next year, you won't ever want to use it again. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, so now I want to transition. We're seeing a couple of different questions coming in on functions. So Michael and Andy, I'm expecting you to co-op these ones together. Uh, the first one is what kind of governor limits are going to apply to Salesforce functions? Yeah, I can I can take that one. So that's really uh, that question gets to one of the core things we're trying to solve with uh, with functions. We we want uh, to provide a, a great compute option for developers that are uh, perhaps a little bit constrained with what they can do uh, currently in the platform. So functions run outside of the transaction, which means that. Uh, we can give developers a lot more freedom in terms of the amount of CPU that they get to consume, the amount of memory that they use uh, in that program, and also like the different types of libraries and components that they can pull into uh, into their uh, function to to get to get the job done. Um, so um, yeah, the um, the way it's gonna the way we expect it to work is that um, you'll have access to use gigabytes of, of memory in your function if, if you need to do that. And uh, the kind of the ceiling on that really is uh, the amount of uh, compute you want to consume and and um, and that you want to pay for uh, to uh, to to run your function. Um, that's that's really the, the main limitation. Awesome. And we're also seeing questions about the languages that we're able to use while we're using functions. Um, can you give yeah. me an idea of what that's going to be? Yeah. So we're going to launch with uh, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, and that's that's also what we have working in the in the developer preview that uh, customers are trying out al already. Um, we want to uh, fast, uh, and we're also uh, we're also going to be supporting Apex. Um, so obviously, you, you can still write Apex within the core system, but we also want to make uh, Apex available as an implementation choice for functions. 
so you can use all the skills that you've built um, uh, with Apex to, to build uh, to build functions and, and get the scalability benefits that 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 uh, functions give you. Um, then the next one on our roadmap is uh, Java. Uh, we know that Java is important, um, and then we are looking to follow with. Uh, with some of the other programming languages that are supported on, on Heroku today, uh, Python, stuff like that, that, that we have a lot of experience uh, building tooling for. Um, and similar to Heroku, we'd also like to open it up so that even for languages that we can't support or, or that we don't, can't commit to supporting, uh, there's a way for developers to uh, build community, community maintained um, uh, tooling so that they can deploy in, in any programming language that, that makes them happy. Okay. And so that's really exciting, but I know everyone's a little bit nervous now. They're like, what about Apex? So Andy, what about Apex? Yeah, what about Apex? Well, hopefully many of you caught uh, Chris Peterson's awesome session about some of the amazing features that uh, we're adding to Apex. And in fact, we actually added additional uh, net new engineers to Apex team. So we're very still committed to Apex and it's a place where we'll continue to I encourage you to enforce your data integrity for Apex and the data that lives in Salesforce. Functions runs outside the transaction where you'll get those extra um, limit, extra increases around async workloads that you're executing. But we certainly want to make sure Apex is still very key for all the logic that you want to extend with Flow, for example, or email services that you build, or even LWC controllers. So. We see Apex being available in those contexts, and also, as Michael just mentioned, it'll get the extra uh, capabilities offered by functions as well. Awesome. So I now want to transition because I've been seeing a few shout outs in the chat, and all the people are really excited about the sample gallery. But for people who don't know about it, can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yes, sure. So the sample gallery contains a set of sample apps that we have built to help you learn about the newest and latest technologies. Um, the, some of the apps simulate a customer use case and some of the apps are kind of recipes that gives you cold examples, always following the best practices. We have built some of the apps with code, but we also have uh, some features built with low code. We use Flow, we use Process Builder, we have recently released automation recipes. And uh, if you want to go there, you, uh, you, you can look for the sample gallery uh, in Google or you can go from Trailhead and from there you can get access to all the GitHub repos, download the code, clone it and even contribute. If you want to uh, give us new additions to the apps, we are super happy to get your contributions. Also, we have recently released some uh, quick starts in Trailhead that explain what each uh, app is about and how to use them, how to deploy them, and they are really fun. So I recommend you to go to Trihead, look for the quick start, and start uh, getting your hands on. Awesome. And I also saw a couple of questions come in for Kevin, and I want to give you a little bit of time to answer some stuff about Lightning Web Components, because I know there's been a lot of enhancements. Um, and your session later today is about the Lightning Web runtime. Can you tell us a little bit, give us a sneak peek into that session? Yeah, it's great. I encourage people to watch the session a little bit later today on Lightning Web Runtime, because if you think about what we've been doing with UI frameworks and Salesforce, a lot of times it's just thinking about this big Salesforce application within Lax. And Lightning Web Runtime is really focused on giving flexibility and building enterprise applications. So we're delivering the core pieces of this so you can mash them together and build and deploy Salesforce experiences everywhere. And um, you know, this is this is something I've uh, I've been working on quite a while at Salesforce, and, and lots of teams have actually been coming together to make this happen. So think about all of the big pieces we deliver within Lex just being available to you to pick and choose as you want to go and build a, a secure enterprise application that you can deploy anywhere. And that's kind of the big pitch. But uh, watch the session and I go into a bunch of really cool demos that kind of highlight some new uh, capabilities with LWC itself. And uh, sneak peek is really like LDS is totally cool. And uh, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, Lightning Data Service is super exciting. Um, so you also mentioned there like using uh, Lightning Web Components anywhere. And I noticed that we've had this much bigger focus on open sourcing our technologies. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as the future of our open source contributions? 
For sure. That's a great question. And like Salesforce is on an amazing journey with open source. Um, you know, LWC itself open sourced at the last TDX, uh, but this was not the first product at all. Like Claire mentioned Oak Cliff, which uh, Salesforce open source quite a while ago. And there's many, many other projects like going to open source at salesforce.com. You can actually see tons of projects, but as far as like the core product teams, um, we have it in our mind that we are building for open source. So as things become ready with Lightning Web Runtime, especially, you're gonna see more open source repos appear on uh, Salesforce's uh, uh, GitHub site. So uh, we're just at the beginning of the journey and it's only gonna strengthen, like we wanna build everything in the open. Um, you can actually see we made a big investment with LWC last Dreamforce. We launched uh, a request for comments website you can go to rfcs.lwc.dev. That's all of our designs that we're actively working on. Um, and it's like, you see what the developers are writing right now. Um, we have some really cool designs out there around efforts we're making with server-side rendering. This is fun to check out. Um, there's also a, a module resolution, which I think people will be interested to, to read. Where, uh, and that's also uh, something I demo in, in the session. But uh, we're just trying to be more open, not just with the source code, but also with the designs um, that are coming from the product team. We, we want people to uh, be part of it. And as Alba said, like, hey, you can come and actually send PRs in. Um, you know, just by doing this and getting it out there, Renee Winklemeyer, who's a great ISV, I love working with them, created the Create LWC application as an open source project. Right, so we see strength in the ecosystem by making things open and giving the ability for people to build. So we're only investing more and more in open source. And, and, and um, it's, it's oh. worth calling out that the Lightning runtime itself is available as open source, right? So if you want to run that runtime in a Heroku app that you're building for a customer facing experience and still use your skills as a Lightning web component developer, you can still apply those inside a Heroku context through that runtime, right? Yeah, yeah, you can you can absolutely take. Um, I feel like I'm giving more and more of my session as you make me answer these questions too. But yeah, the 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 code portability becomes increasingly higher as all of these projects are also geared for open source and definitely like deploying in Heroku very easy to do. Uh, we have another LWC question here too. Will the Lightning Web components support the theme and part elements once those are standardized? Uh, that's a great question. And we partner with the standards bodies. We're very active in the W3C. Uh, we talk to browser vendors all the time. We actually did uh, some early contributions to parts. Uh, parts is only available right now in Chromium. And I think maybe it came online for Firefox. Uh, the theme standard isn't uh, as far along developed. So parts is on the roadmap and we're watching it to see when we could use it. But we're also paying attention to what's available today. And one of the things that's available today to do theming and styling is CSS variables. So uh, we tend to actually go with what the, the, the is available in web browsers today to use, and we're always watching for the future. So um, we're actively participating in the, in the parts effort, and, it's, and you've seen it start to ship in browsers, which is amazing. Uh, and then the themes is still kind of uh, being developed. There's, there's conversations going on, but it's not as far along as as parts, but we do watch, we actively watch standards and we try to uh, put time into it to make sure that browsers will actually build the code that people need so we can even remove more code from our frameworks. Like that's an ultimate goal. Awesome. Now we're gonna transition one more time. Well, probably one more uh, out of many more transitions, uh, but we have seen a lot more questions come in, Claire, now that people have been working on the chat for you. Um, so one of those is, um, can you say more about Cold Builder's integration with source control tools like Git and also how that maps to the new uh, new DevOps Center? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Code Builder will come with a Git integration already built in, uh, which is awesome. So you can um, connect whatever external repository that your team is using or create an account um, with any of the, the many source control uh, versions out there uh, that are using Git. I used to work at Bitbucket, we support Bitbucket, we support GitHub, we support GitLab, we support everything. Um, and it, and really you can use whatever you want. In terms of the 
differences and sort of how these things work together at the DevOps Center. The DevOps Center is uh, going live initially with uh, GitHub integration. Um, and I know that there are plans in the future, as, as we've said many, many times before, we like to build our tools agnostic. Um, so you'll get the ability to bring Bitbucket or GitLab on, into the fold if, if you want to. But right now they're, they're launching first with GitHub. Um, and these things can work together um, or they can work separately. What we're really, really trying to do is enable anyone and everybody who is building on the Salesforce platform to use source control. We think it is super, super, super important. We also know that you work on teams where not everybody is a pro developer. And so we wanna give you the tools that you need to enable everybody on the team to work in source control. So DevOps Center started first thinking about the admin. How does the admin get their changes into the source control system? And, um, and that's really where they started. Now, DevOps Center's longer term vision, I'm not going to like steal Karen's thunder, is going to be bigger than that. Um, but generally, right now, it's focused on helping the person who maybe doesn't already have a GitHub account get their changes into that repository and then also work well with the rest of the people on their team. So if they have pro devs, that they can work together. So just like you saw in Zane's uh, presentation earlier today, she made changes programmatically on VS Code. She could have done the exact same thing in Code Builder, move those changes into the sandbox, and the admin can then use DevOps Center to determine which of the changes they want to actually move into the source control system. Um, and that flow works today out of the box. Um, and in the future, they'll be able to manage their sort of release cycle there. And I, I got to add, Claire, this is actually the reason why I said it was my favorite feature, because when you're saving it, it's not like that code goes straight to production. Right. It actually goes through and you can run it through CI, CD and have like super high quality. Like this is this is amazing that the whole tool chain is coming together like this. So yeah, I'm glad you got the question. We have a whole session on release management patterns later. It doesn't actually, it talks about today and there's so much stuff that you can do today, but it doesn't even touch on that future of where is the DevOps center going? What can you do with code builder and all those things? So we're just, we're, we want to enable you to have the, a fully robust release management process. And that's uh, happening later today in the architect channel. So be sure to look at both the developer and architect channel for all these sessions we're calling out since some of them are in different channels. Um, okay. One other question for you. You mentioned a lot of like cloud-based Git and somebody has commented and they want to know what about on-prem Git? Is that going to be supported? Yeah, yes, eventually. I mean, we will, we, we're not going to keep you from using what you want to use. Brilliant. Okay. And one other question, people are curious, can we use the terminal in Code Builder? Is that still built in? Absolutely. Yes. The terminal comes. That was the weirdest way to say that. I apologize. <laughs> Absolutely. You'll get it. Uh, the Salesforce CLI comes pre-baked in Code Builder. Um, so you'll be able to use the terminal. You'll be able to use the command palette. Um, if you're used to, I don't like the command palette. I'm, I like to run help on every single one of the commands before I run it. And so I use the terminal all the time, but I use it in Code Builder. Awesome. Oh, that's super exciting. Okay. So we're transitioning back over to Michael for a moment. Can we use the any NPM package with functions? Yes, that's that's a big part of what we want to achieve with, with functions. We want to let you build on the Salesforce platform while also leveraging all the awesome open source components and uh, maybe packages or software that you buy as, as part of the logic that, that you're building with, uh, with functions. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And I think this one's more for Andy, but what kind of platform limits are going to apply to functions? Yeah, so we're, we're, as Michael said, we are greatly increasing CPU and memory or heat. Um, and that will be available as an extra uh, piece of capability for functions, as Michael explained, but also async limits. Um, we know that a lot of customers struggle with the async limits with batch apex and queueables. So we're basically allowing you to emit your functions to a new queue for those processing where those traditional limits won't apply. Uh, Salesforce API limits around interacting with the data will be in a separate bucket so they won't consume your Salesforce org API limits. There will still be limits around that initially, but we're working incrementally in our roadmap to make data access much more rapid with less limits. So essentially heap CPU and async limits are going to be much more improved. You'll spend less time working around those limits and more time writing business logic. 
Yes, that is what we've been wanting for so long and I'm so excited. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, one more question. Not sure who's gonna answer this one, but will functions support other clouds other than just like Heroku and core? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, Salesforce Functions is part of our unified vision for platform for Salesforce. And as a result, you'll see functions if you're uh, a customer using Commerce Cloud or Marketing Cloud in the future, we want to make that technology and feature available regardless of all, all our pro any of the products and technologies you're using. Uh, we're obviously target targeting those on Lightning Platform initially, and then move on to Roku and other clouds. But uh, the vision is all clouds, multi-cloud. <laughs> Awesome. I'm so excited. Okay, next. I mean, I'm excited about all of this. I'm just trying to, to go through the questions. Um, okay, I think, Kevin, we are back to you. Are there third party libraries that are compatible with LWC? So that's a great question. Um, LWC itself, uh, especially in open source, you can use any uh, library you want. Uh, when you come into lexenforce.com, we also have locker technology. And um, Locker does, uh, uh, you know, have a little bit more uh, regulation of what's going on inside of the DOM. Um, but we're evolving uh, the support within Locker for JavaScript frameworks to make it even easier to add more and more JavaScript frameworks. There's always uh, things you can do today, like we do have the Lightning Container component where you can execute and run any framework you'd like. Um, and you know, we, we have other, other ways where you can use a static resource. I know that's not preferred, but, um, we are working so that our core locker technology will support more and more, uh, JavaScript frameworks in the future. Okay. Um, and then the next question I have, um, actually we're back to you, Alba. So I know a lot of our wonderful viewers here are actually still working in Visual Force, and you just created a really great application on migrating from Visual Force to Lightning Web Components. Can you tell us a little bit about like what that journey is like for you, um, and maybe your number one thing that was really helpful when you were doing that transition? Yeah, so well, uh, one of the main things is that Lightning Web Components is completely based on web standards. So if you learn learning with components, you are really learning JavaScript. And that is going to be super helpful if you want to learn any other JavaScript based technology. Also, Lightning Web Components leverages all the native capabilities that are implemented in browsers. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be super performant. And it's also um, it works very nicely in mobile. Everything that you build uh, will work very nicely in desktop and both in mobile in most of the cases. So it's a super cool technology to use. And in addition to, uh, to that, with all the tooling that we have released, your uh, productivity as a developer is going to be maximized a lot. So I strongly recommend you to make that move. Um, some resources that you can use to start doing that is, uh, well, a sample app that we have just released, which is called Visual Force to LWC. You can find that in the sample gallery. We have a quick start for that sample app. And we have released also a trailhead module, which is called Lining Web Components for Visual Force Developers that you can start with. So I strongly recommend you to, to give it a try and try to make the move. And I'm also seeing some other questions and maybe Alba and Kevin, you can tag team this one, um, but say I'm brand new to Salesforce and I'm just trying to learn Lightning Web Components, where should I go? Trailhead. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for, for sure, like starting with the Trailhead modules, we even get you like, this is how you set up your VS Code environment, right? Like it's it's one of the better places to start uh, to, to ramp up. Uh, but then truthfully, after you've gotten a bit of taste for how you set that up, uh, the recipes, LWC recipes, is the next place I've heard from many developers that that's a really fast ramp up tool. Um, and so for teams of larger developers where they're trying to ramp up in LWC, um, after they've gone through the initial trailhead introductions and figured out how just the tooling works and getting it set, uh, focusing on LWC recipes and the patterns there is, is perfect. Because as Alva had mentioned, like she developed all these recipes that have just shipped as well to help Visual Force developers jump in. Um, these are reviewed by the core engineers on the team across the board and everyone's like giving scrutiny to like, is this the best possible pattern we could have on Salesforce? So we highly recommend uh, copy and paste and start from there. You're going to get up to speed faster. So uh, Alba, I, I don't know if you have more to add to that, but that's my uh, take. 
Yeah, I will add to that that the uh, LWC documentation is great. You have a playground there that you can use to try out your code and share your code. You can try out also the different versions of the base components and modify them uh, live and see the, the results. And I think it's also useful to learn. And I also just want to make a quick shout out to our resources page, which my moderators are going to tell you how to get to. Um, but that is a great place where we've already linked all of that for you. So you can go check out all those different modules, uh, those resources and start getting hands on after the show. Um, all right, I have a few more questions that have just come in for you, Kevin. The first one is, are there any plans for the data table component to be available on mobile? Uh, the data table is the component we get asked about all the time. In fact, I hold public office hours and I hope to talk to people about frameworks and people come up and they talk to me about data table. Um, so the, the team is, is actually investing a lot of effort in data table, but we don't have a time frame in which we would um, you know, announce that it would be ready for mobile. And I, I would point people a little bit to our base components open source project, which is available out there. And we've started to make uh, more and more of the base components available there. And so at some point in the future, you're likely to see uh, a lot of the code that we, we use in, in our components to show up there. But right now, uh, no, no date to, to share for mobile support. OK. Um, now, Michael, I have a question for you. Can you speak to, quote unquote, cold start times for functions and whether Salesforce is going to provide a way for uh, functions to stay warm? Yep. Uh, yeah, so just in case for folks that might not be familiar, a lot of function as a service uh, products um, have a, a phenomenon called, called cold start, which is like something invokes the function and then it takes uh, maybe a few seconds or, or even longer uh, for the function to actually start executing. And I think this is, um, so this is a great thing where we can actually uh, benefit from uh, others, others having built uh, fast solutions before us and, and, and learn, learn from that. And it's definitely something that we're uh, looking uh, very closely at, both making sure that um, uh, like just out of the box, the uh, Salesforce functions have very, uh, very low cold start times for, for normal functions. Um, so so that, that's going to be good. And also providing uh, toggles um, so that if you really care very much that, that, you, that uh, your function starts executing immediately, you can, you can turn on um, uh, that your function to, uh, that there's always like a, a container available to uh, to handle uh, an incoming function invocation uh, immediately. So yes, yeah, definitely something we're uh, we're looking at. Awesome, and thank you for the quick definition of cold and warm. I know a few people were a little confused by that when I first asked the question. Um. All right. Let's see. So back to you, Kevin. Are there any plans on supporting TypeScript for Lightning Web components natively without transpiling yeah. back to JavaScript? <laughs> I love this question. Again, we get it, it almost uh, probably just as much as the data table question, I would say. Um, the, the truth is uh, we don't have plans to support TypeScript natively within our compiler on platform. And part, part of the reason is really that TypeScript with each version introduces breaking change. So the support matrix grows over time. However, um, you will see like in a lot of our sample projects and even the Create LWC app, there's options for using and building with TypeScripts. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, people would really like it to be supported in the native compiler, but we really don't have plans to do that uh, right now. Uh, we really view it as this is something you can do within your build step. Uh, there's great CI CD as well that could help out here. If you think about it, I'm sure that there's a scenario where we could make it easier and easier and easier. But as far as the core compiler, um, we don't have plans to support it. All right. And um... I am going to transition now to Andy. Um, where are some use cases where functions is going to win out over using Apex? Well, certainly um, Apex um, is great for the reasons I described earlier on um, being in the transaction and protecting that data. But where you've got large workloads that you're doing asynchronously, and maybe you're breaking those up into smaller pieces to work within the governor limits, you'll not have to do that. We'll want, allow you to build your workloads and execute them. Those might be calculating uh, price book entries. It might be calculating large discounts. It might be doing other analysis of large, load, large quantities of data. We want you to have the freedom to do that with the compute and memory uh, that you need to be able to compute that within one function. And ultimately, functions will allow you to 
use other open source libraries. So if you need your at your disposal of the libraries to perform those computations or generate images or manipulate images, then those, as Michael says, are available to you because of our ability to use NPM libraries. So the world's frankly your oyster in terms of what you can do with functions and uh, those open source libraries. And if you happen to have a lot of Apex code that's struggling with compute, uh, then that's going to find its way into Apex functions as well. So very exciting. Awesome. And then the next question, uh, sort of related, are we able to package functions when those come out for like ISVs and our partners? Yeah, absolutely. Packaging is on our roadmap. We're working hard to get that out as soon as possible along with functions. Um, we're very committed to making sure our partner ecosystem can leverage this technology to empower their customers and build their products at new levels of sophistication and flexibility. Cool. All right, Claire, we are back to you. Uh, is there any tooling on the roadmap to help customers break their profiles into permission sets? It's a really great question. And I uh, speak to the, the perm set and profiles team a lot about this issue. And we're sort of all aware that it's a problem and we need tooling. What's great is now that perm set groups are out, I think we're ready to dive into that. And so it's one of the things that we want to make easier in the future. Um, I would say we don't have something in the next couple of months. Um, there is an app on App Exchange that allows you to convert your profiles into perm sets. We want to make it easier and have um, a CLI command to do that. Um, and we're working with that team uh, to, to make that a reality. Uh, we just aren't quite there yet. Uh, but know that it is a, it is an internal conversation that's often happening. And shout out to Sharon, uh, my partner on that side of the events. Awesome. I think I have time for just one more question before we wrap up. So um, let's see. Kevin, I think I'm going to hop back to you. It's a JavaScript question. What was the intent behind going with uh, promises instead of async await? Um, I actually uh, was looking at that question uh, and thinking, like, I, I'm not certain what, what it's focused on, um, but uh, like really promises at the time were more mature than async await and the support was was broader. And so that's that's uh, why why we've gone with it. But we're consistently looking to upgrade the support to like ES uh, 10 or 11 now, I think that we're on uh, to include support for more and more JavaScript language. So things will things will uh, make make their way into LWC as we continue to evolve, but we we always watch for the right balance of when it's mature enough to bring it in. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that about wraps us up. Thank you so much to my wonderful panelists for joining me today and answering as many of those questions as we could. I know I've learned a lot and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the episodes that are going to be happening throughout the day on the developer, architect, admin, and uh, ecosystem and community channels. I know there's a lot of great information there. If you'd like to hear and learn more about the other features we talked about, you can also visit our resource page, which our moderators are linking for us once more, uh, where you can see all of the things that we just talked about, links to how to get hands on on Trailhead, as well as um, some of the announcements around Code Builder and other things that have been happening today. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your Trailhead DX experience. <laughs>